Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Body Learning. Today my guest is Tommy Thompson, who is an Alexander Technique teacher in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's been teaching for almost 40 years. He's also the director of the Alexander Teacher Training School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, he uh, works, he teaches at the Institute for Advanced Theater Training, the American Repertory Theater at Harvard University. And he uh, originally, his early lessons were all with Frank Pierce Jones. And he was essentially trained by Frank Pierce Jones. And we're going to talk today about Frank, about his teaching legacy, and about Tommy's experiences with him. Tommy, welcome to the show. Hi, Robert. Good to good to talk to you. Um, I think Tommy Thompson. I'm sorry. I think Frank Pierce Jones is someone that a lot of Alexander teachers know about from from his book. But I don't think a lot of teachers have a clear idea of what his particular approach to teaching the technique was. And I think we'll we'll probably get to that later in the podcast. But could we begin by you just saying a little bit how you came to meet him and what those early lessons were like for you? Uh, Yes. Um, I, I came to Tufts University as the managing director of their theater in 1972. Hmm. I taught acting and directing and dramatic lit. And um, I really had no knowledge about the technique. At that time, I was doing a little bit of everything. Uh, and and um, in a company I had in Santa Barbara, an acting company I had in Santa Barbara when I was in graduate school, one of my actors said he was studying with Judith Stransky in LA, this thing called the Alexander Technique. And that was it. He had a back problem. And, and that's all I'd ever heard. And then I was directing a show the summer of 72 at Tufts before I started the fall teaching. <clears throat> and um, one of the actors in the green room was fiddling around with somebody's head and neck. So I asked him what he was doing. And he talked about the Alexander Technique. And he says, um, you know, one of the the, sort of the grandfather of the technique was here on campus, uh, Frank Pierce Jones. So I called Frank um, probably pretty soon thereafter, and um, I set up a, a less uh, an appointment with him to meet him in his office at Sweet Hall on the on the campus. And um, I went in and and we spoke for about two hours, hmm. and. Um, he was behind his desk. I was sitting in front of it. I'm remembering it all now. And uh, and we talked a lot about you know, his, his teaching, John Dewey, and Aldous Huxley. And um, it was just as I found him to be a very quietly unassuming man with a, very, a deep baritone voice. And, and um, later discovered his brilliance. And... Um, and then towards the end of the conversation, he said, would you like a, a demonstration? Hmm. So I said, sure. So uh, what followed was rather unusual because I didn't have the um, usual aha experience that everybody has. Mm-hmm. I, um, because at the time, I was pretty defended and sort of solid steel. And um, But when he... He started working with me. He was the first person ever to put hands on me from whom I felt no threat, but I had never known I'd felt threatened until he put his hands on me. Interesting. Mm-hmm. was, and I was intrigued. Um, I still was curious about what the technique was. My, my motivation for, for going to see him was uh, often in acting – you know, you're directing a play or, or coaching a scene, and the actor would feel as though they were expressing one thing, but their bodies were revealing something entirely different apart from what they thought they were expressing. Mm-hmm. And that's why I went to see Spank, Frank. There was no other reason and um, uh, to, uh, that I knew of. But um, the, the experience I had with him was intriguing, and I, f- I found out what it was six years later. It was three years uh, after Frank died and three years into my teaching, uh, 
and uh, in a meditation I was having, I uh, I saw my birth, and uh, the doctor was drunk, and they were sobering him up, and they locked my mother's legs together and pushed me back for an hour and a half, and so um, the first hands that touched me were the nurses, uh, a woman's hands, a feminine energy, and the second were a man's, and he did some nerve damage to me, and... Um, with high forcep delivery, and he was drunk. So the first hands that touched me was rejection, betrayal, go back, and the second hands was hurt, hurt me. Mm-hmm. So what f- I had been moving through my entire life, I was 29 at the time, um, never really aware of this, but when Frank touched me, it became apparent through my you know, cellular memory and uh, or connective tissue, muscle memory, uh, what had actually happened. And then two years later, I found an aunt who had been present at the birth process, and she corroborated the story, so I knew that I wasn't making it up. Wow. And so that's why I was interested in Frank. Mm-hmm. I was intrigued more by Frank than I was the technique. Right. And then I went to see him two more times uh, at the same place in his office, on campus, and um, the second time I just kind of bounced up the up the stairs. You know, I, I felt everything that people, most people, do feel, mm-hmm. like kinesthetic feeling of lightness and, and mm-hmm. integration. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then I went away for a while because I was directing Macbeth, and Mac, uh, Helen and Frank, Helen uh, Jones and Frank came to see Macbeth. And in Frank's unassuming way, I mean really unassuming way, uh, I told him, I said, I'm sorry I didn't come back to see you. I I want to study with you. And and he had told me at the time, after the three lessons I had, he says, study with me. Uh, I won't charge you anything. (laughs) Wow. So I said, "Um, I'd like to study with you. It was backstage with Macbeth. And... um, he had forgotten the part about no payment, <laughs> and <laughs> I waited too long. And, uh, and he says, uh, I was curious as to why you didn't come back. I thought maybe I'd done something wrong. <laughs> hmm. yeah, I mean, that's what Frank would feel. And um, I said, no, far from it. So that's, that's how I met him, and, and then I started taking lessons with him. And I would have lessons periodically. And in terms of training, you really couldn't call it a, a training. Um, Towards the end, in the third year, it became very much like a mentor situation where Frank mm-hmm. and I became very good friends. Mm-hmm. And um, and there were a few moments where he sort of pulled me out, of, pulled me aside, so to speak. The the one moment was uh, first moment was um, Don Weed wanted to. Don Weed was a very 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 young man at the time, and um, he wanted to bring Marjorie Barstow to Tufts. So Frank and I got uh, a place for him to, to bring her. And Frank said it was, it was going to be a workshop for those people interested in teaching. And I had no interest in teaching whatsoever. And so um, uh, we found the spot for him and, and, it, and it was being advertised. And, and Frank said, you should come because I'd like for you to meet Marjorie. And he had done the same thing when, when Walter Carrington was in town. You, you come by the house, I'd like for you to meet Walter. Mm-hmm. Dillis. <clears throat> and so the workshop was there, it was ongoing. And I, I actually have a video of it, um, but it's very, very, very poor quality. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's and, and, and you know, Ed Mazel was there. Um, it was quite a few of the, of the uh, Buzz Gummery was there. Mm-hmm. And uh, everybody, it, it was, they, they, they came to see Marjorie teach, and she was about 70 at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, 1974. And so there was one time when Don Weed would, he was going to sit there and, and, and go into a pull down. And you were standing in line and you were supposed to go uh, wait your turn in queue and then take him up um, at, with a guided movement. Uh, in other words, he'd go into a slump and you'd take him out of the, uh, the slump. And I didn't really want to do it because it, 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 it wasn't much of a real-life situation. And I'm standing there waiting my turn, and I'm standing in line, and it gets, becomes my turn. And I'm just standing there. I'm not moving. 
And so everybody's waiting for me to walk over to Don, and I didn't do it. And then across the room, Frank evidently saw my consternation, and he spoke across the room in his deep voice. He says, you can work on me. And I had no idea why he said it. And um, so I went over and I stood behind him. And uh, I, I remember my, my hands were shaking. <laughs> right. I was going to put my hands on Frank. I'd never put my hands on Frank. And um, so I worked with him a little bit. And, and from behind, uh, he was sitting. And then everybody said, well, what are his hands like? And Frank said, well, they're light. And that was it. <laughs> So <laughs> that's great. So that weekend, that weekend, I wasn't home. My wife Julie got the call, and Helen Jones had called and invited me to join an interest group in training. Frank, in other words, was considering, probably. Um, I've actually forgotten if we've had conversations about this now. Um, uh, starting a training at Tufts, and working it into the curriculum at Tufts. Mm. And so there were about, I can't remember, you know, if I, if I had known I was going to spend the rest of my life teaching this work, I would have remembered everything, you know, but I, I had no idea. So he, um, that, that's the only time that he did hands on the back of a chair with me. Mm -hmm. um, and he was guiding us through the way that he had been trained mm -hmm. and uh, with his own flair, I mean, his own, you know, brand. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember how many times we met. Dick Brown was there, and Emil was there for a while. And um, I've actually forgotten uh, the rest of the people who were there, maybe six people, mm -hmm. seven. And we met for, I don't know, six, seven or eight times, maybe. And uh, that's when he started stumbling. Mm -hmm. And when he started stumbling, it was the beginning, you know, the, the diagnosis of brain cancer. Mm -hmm. So I had set up, um, I had set it up for Frank to go and work with the, um, what became the Olympic rowing team in 76. It was in 75 and they were defending their world title and they were training in Princeton. Alan Rosenberg was the, um, the head coach and he had... I, he, and, and, and Alan was having, had a couple of lessons with me. I, mean, I wasn't a teacher. I was just showing him what I knew. And, um, and um, <clears throat> so I arranged for Frank to go to Princeton and um, work with the rowing team. And Frank was diagnosed. Hmm. And so Frank said, um, I think you should do it. And so he sent me to Princeton to work with the rowing team in 75. Mm -hmm. By that time, he was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And he had two brain operations. And um, when I came back from um, Princeton after working with the rowing team, we, I corresponded with him about the work that I was doing. He was excited. And um, I walked into the room. This is significant. I walked into the room, and he had his head was shaved because of the operation, his second operation. And uh, walking in the room, he had a big smile on his face. But before he saw me, he was lying in bed against a pillow with pajamas on. Um, and between his thumb and, 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 and uh, index finger, um, he had the lapel of his pajamas, and he was slightly tugging at it, ever so slightly thumb, forefinger against the lapel, and then he would pull it slightly. And that's when he saw me in a big smile, and I walked in and I sat down and I said, Frank, what are you doing with your pajamas? And he said, I need a reference point for inhibition. Huh. Which was interesting, because it, it, it was characteristically frank, because inhibition wasn't something that he just did. Um, he needed a stimulus. Mm -hmm. But he had narrowed down that stimulus. He couldn't move very well. He had narrowed down that stimulus just with the movement of his, his thumb and his index finger. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, need an, I need a reference point for, in, uh, for, for, for inhibition. Right. Because most uh, his work was based really entirely on inhibition. Mm -hmm. When all the work that I did with him, 
Um, I, I didn't have all that many lessons either. I mean, I, I, I know there's big debate about that, but it, I mean, it hardly matters now. But um, but I had enough <laughs> right. uh, for him to um, take me under his wing and suggest that I carry on the teaching. So when you say that um, his work was very heavily based on inhibition, how, how did that manifest in his teaching? Did he specifically refer to inhibition, or was it just embedded in the way he taught? No. Um, <clears throat> what he, did, he, 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 he did not use direction in his teaching. He mm-hmm. uh, simply just didn't do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, some of these stories are just coming from conversations, and some of them are just known. But uh, he, t- he, t- he told me, he says, he says uh, when I was working with, um, you know, he did one year with FM and two years with AR. Right, right. And, um, and AR had told him that he would never use direction if they weren't in the books that uh, FM wrote. Oh, really? And, yes, oh. he did. Oh. And, and, I, and I'm, what I gather is AR was much more... Um, well, AR really influenced Frank quite a bit, mm-hmm. quite a bit, and um, um, I remember Frank said um, he asked FM when I mean, F- AR when he was going to start teaching when he came out of the training in media, um, where should I put my hands? And AR said, you put them where you need to, you put them where they're needed. And uh, and that marked his teaching as well. In other words, he was addressing the student. He wasn't bringing the student to the work. He was bringing the work to the student, given what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, all of his work was chair work with me. And we would stop, and I would recite Hamlet because I was an actor, and I'd recite Hamlet. And he'd work with me with then. He'd take me up in front of a uh, a bookcase, and I'd reach up and grab the book, and he would guide my movement of my arm, my hand. Mm-hmm. So that I was exerting the appropriate amount of effort and energy to do it. Mm-hmm. So, th- did he do a lot of speaking during a lesson? He talked. Uh, he talked an awful lot while he was talking. He, 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 um, he, <laughs> I, I have a, I have some videos of him teaching mm-hmm. when I was director of the uh, Helen Jones and Dick Brown and I. Helen asked Dick Brown and I to to help her found the. Um, the archives, the mm-hmm. Frank Pierce Jones archives, and later right. the uh, and, uh, Alexandria archives and yeah. at Tufts. Right. So she asked me to direct it, and I directed it, and, and um, for six years. And um, um, oops, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Well, in terms of of his when he was giving a lesson, you you say he did speak a lot. Was it sort of well, yeah, like yeah, Walter yeah, yeah. Carrington <clears throat> talked a lot? Which you where it was sort of. Um, he, Frank he, would talk specifically about what we were doing and why. Okay, because Walter Walter, Walter had had stories, right. and and he and did he? You say he didn't um, use directions. Did, what, what sort of did he leave you uh, after a lesson with some things to work on on your own? Everything was set up as as an ex- exploration. He explained the meaning of direction to me. He explained um, he explained the whole uh, sequence of Alexander's discoveries and and why each one was important for its own reasons mm-hmm. and how direction came into it. I mean, everything that all everybody knows in the Alexander. Mm-hmm. Right. But he did not ask me to let my neck be free, to let my head move forward, enough to let my back lengthen in way. He simply did not do that. What he would do. He would place, again, he was more interested in, in a, you being able to apply the work to what you already did mm-hmm. in a more efficient way. And um, <clears throat> so he, he would bring his hands to the, uh, it would be um, with contact with the uh, occiput and the uh, mastoid process. And he would apply a very subtle pressure uh, to the musculature of the neck mm-hmm. uh, in the region of the, the juncture of the sternocleido and the upper trapezius. Mm-hmm. And um, there would be, it was more of an intentional pressure mm-hmm. rather than a finger pressure because the intention is closer to the nervous system 
Right. And he was he it was almost if he didn't use this metaphor, but I mean he he would. He was fond of Walter Cannon's The Wisdom of the Body, where he, Walter Cannon was the one that, that dealt with homeostasis. And uh, is that Frank was really placing his hands in an already moving stream, an already moving river. Um, things were functioning. What, what he would do is he would accentuate what was already functioning. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he, he, he would apply just enough pressure to um, stimulate um, the muscle tissue, and it would lengthen. And then once he felt the length in the neck, uh, he would apply just a, 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 a bit more pressure. But this time, the pressure sent the movement all the way through the entire organism. Hmm. Uh, but he was not suggesting that I give direction while he was working or that he was giving direction to himself while he was working. Or that you should give direction to you or do anything oh, on, your, on, your, no. on your own, though, outside of lessons? Or? No, nope. he was suggesting mm -hmm. that, you, that you identify what it is that you were doing to Im impede postural reflex. It was so much about the reflex. What are you doing? And, and, and your way of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, sensing that was through, his, through inhibition. Uh, excuse me, through uh, kinesthesia. I mean, the first thing he would explain was kinesthesia. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, and he would explain in a in a wide in a wide variety of ways the way it functions, and that the way that he used it was different at that time than any other teacher was using it. In other words, what he was he would take your head and he would he would say, turn your head, let your head turn in space. Mm -hmm. As your head turns in space. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Let your head turn in space, and then the second one was let the head turn within a given environment. So essentially, they were one in the same, uh, one after the other, and all together, so to speak. So is it be aware of your head turning in space within a given environment, and after you're aware of the head turning in space within a given environment, include as part of your awareness your head's relationship to your body, given what you're doing. But given what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Not just your head, but he started the way that kinesis is actually designed to function. He started with you actively participating in the environment. He and did, not. and mm -hmm. did you find that so that you you obviously after that first lesson or so, uh, maybe you said after the first two or three lessons, you noticed differences in yourself, right? The things that I noticed was that I, all, I did, I, I continued to experience everything I was always experiencing given what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was much more of an expanded field of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, there was less effort exerted. Um, there was a sense of me being in support given what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, I always came out of a lesson wanting to explore at his urging, to explore how I could take what he gave me out into the field. So much so that after a couple of years, <clears throat> um, and I would go in and out periodically. Um, there was one time that I ended up deciding never to leave him again. It was quite interesting. I, I was invited to come play Hamlet at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in, in 1970. And um, but it was a year of the Arab oil embargo, so Tufts was out of session during um, February. So there I was. I resigned from Tufts. I was going to go to Oregon at the Shakespeare Festival, play Hamlet, and direct for two years, and go back into professional theater. And uh, we were out of session in February, and he pushed my contract into the rehearsal period for Hamlet. So I had to decide whether to go play Hamlet and renege on my contract at Tufts and leave my students or, or what. And so ultimately I decided not to play Hamlet and to stay with my students at Tufts. And, um, but I, I didn't know it was actually bothering me to do that. Uh -huh. That's how much in touch I was. And, mm -hmm. um, and I developed probably, I started bleeding internally, you know, my stomach. And I had probably the beginnings of an ulcer, and, but no, nothing ever happened. So I went back to Frank.
And I had three lessons that week and everything was gone. And so I said to myself, this time I'm not going to leave this man. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, I don't think I'll ever want to stop having lessons. Mm -hmm. He says, watch out. It'll change your life. <laughs> so so in terms of, of – I just want to get back to this question of working on your own. You said you know, he encouraged you to explore what he was working with you in lessons on – for you to explore that in the course of your activities outside of lessons, right? Yeah. he, he uh, You know, he was the one that, that said <clears> – he was looking for scientific – ways of explaining the work. John Dewey on his deathbed, Frank told me, he said he urged Frank to give scientific credence to what Alexander claimed. They were John Dewey's words to Frank. And Frank said the rest of his life, that's exactly what he set out to do, is to give scientific credence to what right, I claimed. Right. So he he was looking for a, a scientific way of explaining the pull down, the Alexander fam famous Alexander pull down. Mm -hmm. And what he came up with is is the startle 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 reflex, the pattern, the neuromuscular pattern associated with the startle reflex mm -hmm. involves a simultaneous contraction of the sternocleido and the upper trapezius, mm -hmm. and that's going to dorsiflex the head so that that was everything that Alexander was claiming happens when you interfere with what he called primary control. Right. When you interfere with head neck reflexes is what mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. and so Frank based a lot of his teaching on that that was his paradigm for teaching right and and he, and he would would he would you find yourself exploring that on your own outside well, that's of what lessons? i did See, yeah. that's that's what i did and and first of all i the startle reflex deals with fear right. but the startle reflex the the upside of the startle reflex is it orients you to new information mhm mm and so um that's what we deal with in the Alexander work. We want an appropriate orientation to new information without a reactive, you know, a fear reaction. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to explore it, and I bought a 17-foot kayak, and I would take myself out into the Marblehead Harbor off the coast of Massachusetts. And that's the summer of Jaws, you know, when the, mm -hmm. the shark. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of afraid of that, and I was then. And um, so I would row myself out into the ocean uh, several miles until I became afraid that how do I get back in because mm -hmm. I'm with the ocean. And this is me exploring because Frank was not showing me how to use my hands. And I would go, why? Why is this is the only time that my wife likes driving with me in a car after a lesson with Frank? I'm not reactive. And so I'm out in the ocean and I start trying to paddle back. And uh, but I'm going towards Spain rather than Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and and I legitimately was afraid, and so I sat there. I said, you know, I mean, I can't remember what I was actually saying, but 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 I sat there in the ocean, bouncing around, and um, a couple of miles out to sea. And I'm saying, you know, you're in trouble. You're going to have to figure out how to get back because all this thrashing about you're doing is not. It's not working. So while I have the paddle in the water and I'm sitting there trying to reason out a way to get out of it, I begin to feel a movement beneath the waves that I can see. The paddle is, is giving me a, a means of feeling the movement of the ocean beneath the waves that I can see. And I'm realizing that what I'm really contacting is the whole of the ocean and not just the wave that distinguishes itself from the ocean. And the wave that distinguishes itself from the ocean is the habit. And the ocean is the integrity of the organism. Mm -hmm. And Frank believed in the evolutionary integrity of the organism. It's functioning. It's working. We have patterns of interference that interfere with that. They all well, you know, it's habits, habits of identity. Right. And so I'm going through all of this thinking and feeling that, and suddenly I start to move the paddles. But I'm taking advantage of the of the movement beneath the waves that I can see, and I realize that I'm using the ocean to paddle with. And so I start doing that, and I'm, I'm going straight to shore, and I'm doing it quite easily. So I took that kayak out 
over four months during the summer. And at the time, I had a lot of time because sometimes, you know, a professor has a lot of time. And so I was going out three, four times a week and into the ocean and practicing using my hands to, to, to do this. Mm-hmm. And when I came back at the end of the summer, when I put my hands on people, they were going up. Mm-hmm. And so I was really taking what Frank said into the field, so to speak, because that's what he was urging you to do. Take it out and apply the principles and the concepts of the work and find your own way of working with it. So, so and, do you think that part part of that um, was simply having the sensitivity to detect that underlying uh, energy flow in the ocean? Would it be that or was it something deeper than that? Well, I think the 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 work with Frank, I was also doing a lot of deep meditation at the time, and I was also doing a lot of martial arts, you know, the kung fu, bakwa, and yin yi. At the same time, I was working with Frank. Frank was also having lessons in Tai Chi at the time. Nobody knows that. Mm-hmm. And um, I... Um, <clears throat> A lesson with Frank, he gave half-hour lessons, <clears throat> and they they simply encouraged an inquiry. You know, I mean, he, he left you with an experience, but he gave you a way of reasoning through the experience in a completely non-reactive way. And his hands were beautiful. They were brilliant. Mm-hmm. And um, he had always he had one hand in his pocket while he was teaching. He would teach with one hand. He would switch hands, would put one hand in the pocket and then put the other hand in the pocket. Mm-hmm. There was no going in and on a monkey or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was as natural as possible. So you, when you walked out of his lessons, you felt like you were taking that lesson right into, in a natural way, right into your environment, right into your world that you live in. And the relationships that you in, and he was also big on on on, on relationship, mm-hmm. and so it was simply quite natural to take it into another activity, and 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 I of course took it into acting and directing, mm-hmm. and uh, and then came the kayak, and then came a whole mess of other things that I would I mean I would set up situations myself and explore them. And it was all based on his work, right. really everything based on Frank's work. So looking back, I mean, obviously since Frank died, a lot of time has gone by and you've obviously encountered a lot of other Alexander teachers. What would you say was the really distinguishing aspect of his approach to the work? Well, I think it was the... the um, his steadfast belief in the wisdom of the organism, the wisdom of the body, mm-hmm. is that, is that um, nothing that he did would work if it weren't already there to work. Um, mm-hmm. So he was never trying to impose some new direction, as it were, at so much as show you or help was, you get out of the way of a block of something you were. He was he was guiding you into thinking your way out of. What it is you were you were doing? I mean, his, the monkey trap was his favorite uh, metaphor. Right, you know? the monkey puts his hand in a bottle, grabs a walnut, can't get it out. That one, exactly. Yeah, but so it's interesting. You said he was t- he was teaching he was teaching you to learn from learning how to learn, learning how. Yeah, to- which is maybe somewhat different from how many teachers approach the work today. I think is radically different. Rad- that. Well, yeah, I wanted to yeah. understate it. Um, and so, so he that could, I suppose, explain why he wasn't interested in directions particularly. Well, he thought the directions, uh, he found them valuable at a certain stage in his learning process, but he, right. he also found that they turned into kind of a litany. Yeah. And he also felt as though... They were a substitute for thinking. Mm 
-hmm. And if you, if, you, if you were just giving the directions, you weren't really paying attention kinesthetically to what you were actually doing, and you really weren't um, in the inhibitive process. Mm -hmm. uh, you, um, well, yeah, here's here's a question. Um, I mean, say if if you imagine that most Alexander teaching is about how you direct yourself using your brain to send messages to the rest of you. Um, would you say that Frank was perhaps somewhat more interested in how messages, uh, uh, sense uh, messages about what you were sensing, got to the brain in the first place? Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, when you give directions, you know, ask yourself what you're doing. They're they're, they're more like affirmations, you know, and affirmations mm -hmm. are used by many teachers in in, in, in various. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But. <clears throat> The moment you decide to let your neck be free, you're not creating some mystical freedom in the neck. For a brief moment in nervous system time, you're not doing what you usually do. Right. And then the nervous system takes you right back into a homeostatic place. And that's what Frank was guiding you towards. Mm -hmm. You know, it was that, 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 that pause between stimulus and response is where the change takes place. Mm -hmm. And you want to be present. And I, I mean, my term for it is meeting yourself, being yourself. And then deciding if that's the self you want to be. Right. But do, do you think that he, in his view of things, as near as you can tell, that a, a, a major problem was people not being in touch with their senses in the first place? Yes, very much so, because that's his whole emphasis on explaining right. periodically throughout all of his lessons the importance of uh, an appropriate kinesthetic sense of perception. Right. And I think... The way some, may, maybe a lot, maybe most teachers tend to work is to send out these directions to yourself, which are, are designed to have beneficial effects. But it sounds like what you're saying is that Frank's approach was to emphasize how the information came into your brain to even know what to direct what would be a useful way to direct or what would be a useful way to change? Well, the other thing is is the very self that's giving the direction is the very self that created the necessity of giving the direction. Right. It's, so, right. I mean, that's, that's the it, issue. It's and a messy so, situation. Absolutely. It is. It is. It is. So right. uh, it's um, – I think inhibition for him made perfect sense. I mean, it, it made perfect sense. <clears throat> Uh, mm -hmm. a heightened kinesthetic sense of perception. And and the other thing that, that again, the thing that really distinguished him at the time, I don't think that's true today, but I, at the time, was it wasn't inward. It was not inward. You know, he was a great believer in introspection and extrospection at the exact same moment. And that's the way we're designed to function. Mm -hmm. We're designed to, to be both at once. And... Um, so he he was interested in that expanded field of attention that included not just what you were doing, but how you were using yourself to do it. His way of explaining these things was so simple. I mean, one of his my favorites is is the way of you know heightening the neuromuscular system so that the voluntary does not impede the reflex, and the reflex facilitates the voluntary. Mm -hmm. And that's what it, I mean, that's, I mean, he's, he's, he was so interested in the reflexive aspect of the movement. He would take his hand and place it on your back, around your 12th thoracic. And he would say, it was physics. And he'd say, I want you to meet the pressure of my hand, meet the pressure of my hand and just ask you to keep meeting the pressure of his hand. And as you do that, if I give just a little bit more pressure and then just take you straight up and down, straight up and down, straight up and down. I have it on film. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, <clears throat> but yeah, inhibition rules. I mean, it, it's, 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 um, and he, 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 and the, the thing about me walking in and finding him pulling on his lapel of his pajamas, I mean, he, he needed a reference point for inhibition. I mean, he, he needed a stimulus and the stimulus is always present, but you're not going to sense the stimulus without a kinesthetic awareness. And, um, but kinesthesia is not just about feeling muscle t tension and tonus. I mean, it, it gives you a sense, it, it's, it's your way of finding yourself geographically. 
in time and space. It's your way of knowing where you are at any given moment, given what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, he he suggested I read Walter Cannon and Charles Sheraton, you know, who coined the term proprioception. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I um, and and he was fond of John Dewey's thinking and activity, mm -hmm. and he was very 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 influenced by Dewey and, and Dewey's thinking, and, um, and he was a scholar. Frank was an as an old school scholar. Yeah. You know the thing that the thing that he was fascinated with. I mean, he said he told me, and I, I think it's in the book. I forgot. It's been a long time, but I, I, um, he, um, ah, shoot, I lost it again. Um, well, well, he was a professor of classics, right? Well, yeah, yes, he was. And I think that's uh, it. It's kind of fascinating that he, um, I guess, as a result of that conversation with Dewey, perhaps. And told him to find some scientific basis. He trained himself in uh, in science. In science, and and, and he, he he set up uh, using strobe lights and so on. To in his book, you'll see all that stuff where he would. Um, but uh, see, he got he he was. I mean, he a perfect classics is was a perfect. Uh, um, beginning for him I mean it just carried over naturally because he got that strobe idea from he and Helen were watching the Rockettes in New York uh -huh. and they were watching them kick their feet up in the air and that's where he got the strobe effect from right and um, and so when he trained him he got his he got his um, uh, master's degree in psychology from Harvard posthumously so he was studying the entire time. He was a great believer in continuing to study, just as he thought the teacher should be learning as much as the student should be learning at any given moment during a lesson. Mm -hmm. But they never stopped learning. So, so he, I mean, and he ended up doing some of the very first experimental work, um, verifying the effectiveness of the Alexander Tech using technology that today I think we would probably bypass in favor of slow motion photography or something like that but but i mean he he entered this field that was really in some ways quite different from what his training had been and what he had been doing up until then well he was also the first to do that uh, he really was the first to to extensively uh go into scientific research into the nature of the work when he applied for grants he didn't do it on the alexander technique because he wouldn't get the money mm -hmm. he was he would research Kinesthesis. He would research fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. He knew his way around the system. His way around the system. Yeah, right. right. But he, 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 nobody else was doing this. Nobody. Right. There was no other research of any significance before him. That's for sure. And of course, he was also writing the, the his book at during the the time the time I assume during the time you you knew him. He was right. Well, he was writing the book. He was finishing it. Um, well, that's an interesting little history too. Is that he he died. He he had. Dick Brown would be better at this than I am in remembering. But but uh, he there were only a few things left in the bibliography to finish. Frank had finished the book. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of things that weren't in the book that they put in the the second edition of the book later on, um, which I used when I gave my paper on Frank mm -hmm. at the first Congress. Um, it was it it. Um, uh, Dick Brown really put the book together and brought it to publication after Frank died. Mm -hmm. And Helen asked Dick and I, <clears throat> we went over to her, her apartment. Uh, again, I can't remember how long we took. I, we, it was at least four or five months, I guess. They would go over to the apartment at, at once a week and we'd all sit around the dining room table and she wanted us to just go through to we'd read out loud the whole book mm -hmm. and uh it was in draft form before it went into galley and um i think she i think it, i think she just i think she needed a company and mm -hmm. i think she wanted to understand her husband but that's all my personal thinking but but um she just wanted the uh, the book to uh, to have no mistakes and mm -hmm. and dick knew much more about it than I did. I mean, I was just there. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, the book was being looked at um, 
a year before it was published. Mm -hmm. And um, and Frank told me on his deathbed, he said he said uh, he felt as though he had concluded his life and done exactly what he was charged to do by Dewey, and that he devoted the rest of his life to it. And he felt as though that once you have a book, you are a little bit of an authority on the technique. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, so, well, that's an it's an amazing. Is there anything else you want to add before we we come to an end? Um. Well. Well, I think that you know. I mean, when you see Frank's picture on his book, I mean. People, a lot of people say it looks like Eisenhower. And, and, yeah, uh, right. Yeah. But he's got a pretty s stern, iconic uh, demeanor in, in the picture. Mm -hmm. Very handsome man. And um, But in life, <laughs> he was filled with smiles. He was filled with smiles, completely unassuming, brilliant. His hands were like feathers. Mm -hmm. um, they were big. And... Um, and he listened. He listened to you. And while you were having a lesson with him, it was a dialogue between the two of you, and learning was taking place. The, 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 the truth was not in the technique. The truth was in what happened between the teacher and the student at, at a given moment. And um, so he really was teaching you how to learn. And one of his uh, you know, articles was learn, learning how to learn. Mm -hmm. And um, I, um, if he had set up a training, if he had d gone through, if he had not had died of cancer and he had done the training course, um, it would have been a completely different training, uh, a totally different training. You know, he was not part of STAT. He was not part of any of those things. Right. Uh, because Barlow wrote him uh, and asked for... Um, asked for monetary assistance to, to, to create stat and Frank sent him money. And then he wrote him back later on after stat was created and he said, we'd love you to have you join stat, but of course you'll have to come over and take refresher courses. Because you're, <laughs> you're, this is 15 years after Frank's research. He said, because your, your uh, certification is signed in lieu of Alexandria by AR. And so even then, that he, you know, he was not being accepted as legitimate. Yeah. And Frank just laughed. I mean, he just said, you know, what can I say? Yeah. Marj Marjorie didn't join. Frank didn't join. Right. Well, I mean, that's he was, he was great friends with Walter. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and Marge, and uh, it was Frank that sent Marge out to Southern Methodist. I don't think anybody knows this. I mean, it, it, he was asked to come out to Southern Methodist, and. Um, and give the workshop, but that's when he was stumbling. So he called Marjorie and said, why don't you go instead? And that's when she started her career of all these workshops. Right, and this was so, when she was in her 70s. She was 70 at the time. Yeah, yeah, she was 70, and that's when her career took off. That's when it took off. Yeah, I, I met her about 10 years later, less than 10 years later. Well, I think this is probably a good place to, to bring the our talk to an end. Um, my uh, guest today has been Tommy Thompson, who's an Alexander Technique teacher in Cambridge. She's also the director of the um, Alexander Teacher Training School in Cambridge. And we'll put a link to his website by the interview. You can learn more about him. And um, I'll also put a link to a site where you can Learn more about the Alexander Technique and locate a teacher near you. Tommy, thank you so much for this. I'll tell you one last little, uh, little story. It sure. Surprised me. Is that, <clears throat> um, I mean, Frank really did, you know, he altered my life completely. And um, uh, years later, years later, um, after several years after my wife died 11 years ago um, I was at the cemetery <clears throat> and the cemetery is called Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge and right. you look and, yeah. and, and Julie is buried at the top of the hill and overlooks um, a pond a very beautiful pond 
and you can walk around the pond. And, and I, that's where I'll be at some point when I go. And, um, and so as I was walking around the pond to look for another grave site for of another friend. And, and I walk around and there's Frank's. And suddenly I realized that uh, Frank and I will both be in the same cemetery. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's 600 feet from each other. Oh, that, that's amazing, isn't it? It was quite beautiful, actually. Yeah. It was a very beautiful yeah. moment. I mean, I remember being at his funeral, but I had no idea where I was in the cemetery. Right. But um, so that one just sort of concluded everything for me when I found that. That's beautiful. And hey, so, thank you so much for this, Tommy. Okay. okay.